Hello. I think we should be live, but as always, I always like to ask if anyone's already here, if you want to put in the chat uh, that you can see and hear me, that'd be great. Let's see, it looks like there is some people already. Oh, cool. Yeah, quite a few people, at least according to YouTube. If you want to say hello in the chat, uh, that'd be great. I see someone actually already did. They said good afternoon from St. Petersburg, Florida. Welcome, Chris, if you're still here. I actually, uh, I'm in Seattle now, but I moved here from Melbourne, Florida, which is like an hour south of Orlando. And uh, we'll get going in just a couple minutes. We're going to wait for more people to join. Someone else said hello. And uh, if you want to also put in the chat, you know, where you're watching from, that's always interesting to hear about. And maybe uh, if you're building something interesting with large language models, that would also be great to hear. Also, I apologize. I might have woken up with a cold or allergies or something. So my nose is a little stuffy if I sound weird. That's why. But we're still going to do the workshop. Someone's watching from India. Awesome. It's always fun to see where people are watching from. Usually it's uh, all over the world, which I think is really exciting and something really cool about virtual events. Someone said Frankfurt, Germany. Now, what time is it over there? Pretty sure it's a big time shift for both of those countries. And uh, again, we're going to wait just a couple minutes before we really get going. Uh, but I'll just outline a couple things. We're going to go through some slides at first, um, and then we're going to go to more of a hands-on portion where we'll run code in a notebook and uh, set up ML monitoring for a large language model. And I'm going to share some links while we're waiting to get going in the chat. Um, and I'll go through setup again a couple times uh, before we really get going uh, to the, on the hands-on part. Uh, the main thing that might take a couple minutes for you to do is just create a free uh, Ylabs account. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, all the links are in the description. Um, I'll share these in the chat at least once um, on LinkedIn Live as well. Um, uh, again, you can create the free account. There's no card or anything required. You just use your email, and then I think you verify your email, and you'll be good to go. And then the other thing is we're going to be using this open source library. Um, you don't have to download it or set it up in your environment right now. We'll be using a online Jupyter Notebook where you won't really have to do all this stuff locally. Uh, but I want to share the link to the GitHub if you do want to check it out. And it's an open source project. We always appreciate um, a star if you want to give it a star as well. And then um, I'll go ahead and share the CoLab Notebook that we'll be working out of. Again, the link is in the YouTube description. And uh, I'll share these again before we get to the hands-on part. So don't worry if you don't save all these links right now. Uh, but these are here if you want to go ahead and start check, uh, get started checking them out. And then also, I'll share a link to the Slack channel. Uh, this is going to be a really good place to ask questions after the event. So hopefully, you find this exciting, and you're putting a large language model in production. And you want to see how it's performing. Um, if you ever run into any issues, or you want to kind of recap things we did here, but for your specific model, that's going to be a good place to ask questions later. Um, it's also a good way to stay connected. So there's a channel you can introduce yourself in. And hopefully, people from this workshop um, and the audience will go join and say hello there. And then real quick, I'm just going to share these links in the YouTube Live as well. And again, I see more people joining. Um, feel free to say hello in the chat and a little bit about yourself, maybe where you're watching from. Uh, maybe if you're building something interesting with a large language model or just machine learning in general, feel free to share um, you know, as much details as you want about what you're uh, building or what you're interested in building. Has anyone, I'm sure most people have used a large language model uh, like ChatGPT, um, et cetera. Has anyone used a uh, like a hugging face model or yesterday Llama 2 just came out, which is pretty exciting? Yeah, I'd love to hear about any use cases people have around a, a large language model application.
And yeah, we'll, we'll get going in about two minutes. So uh, two minutes to say hello in the chat and maybe share something interesting you're working on. And uh, um, also, again, maybe go ahead and click the, uh, the YLabs free account. So we'll be using the open source uh, project today, and then we'll be putting some of the metrics that it generates, and we'll talk about this uh, shortly, um, into the YLabs observability platform so we can monitor metrics about our lang large language models over time, and then set up uh, monitors to trigger alerts when something changes. And if someone has put a large language model um, even if it isn't really in production, but you have it out somewhere or you've been using it. Um, is there anything interesting that you've experienced with it? Like, you know, um, I don't know, generating a phone number in an instance when, uh, you know, it shouldn't have. Like, that's something I've experienced actually with like a, a GPT model where, you know, if you're talking to it, like you're complaining uh, as if you're a customer. Um, it can it can provide a phone number for support, but it wasn't a real phone number or not anyone that I put in there. So I thought that was interesting. There's all sorts of weird uh, use cases that you might not think to um, catch. Someone said they're using Hugging Face for PDF summarization and question answering. Very cool. Which model, um, if you don't mind sharing, which model out of Hugging Face are you using? Someone said Germany is behind. I think they just only got ChatGPT working open to the public currently. That's totally right. Um, I forgot that a lot of Europe has, you know, different laws around using GPT, uh, ChatGPT. And I don't know how it works with a lot of the other large language models, actually. That's, uh, that'd be interesting to hear about, too. I guess it, anything that's hosted uh, or that, that there's laws around or can you take like a llama model and start using I'm, I'm assuming you can for personal stuff but all right so let's go ahead and get started um, again if you're watching on YouTube which I think most people are um, all the links are in the description below that you'll need to do to follow along here and on LinkedIn I posted to them in the chat but if you do um, need any of those links again please uh, ask in the chat form and I'll, I'll be looking at the chat as we go so if you uh, type anything in on LinkedIn live or on YouTube I'll uh, look over and see it and I'll try to answer questions as we go. Um, if I don't get to it as I'm presenting or anything like that, you know, feel free to ask it again at the end or uh, follow up in the Slack channel with the links that I shared as well. And again, I apologize if I sound weird because I think I woke up with a cold or something this morning or allergies. So uh, this is um, an intro to monitoring large language models in production. And we're going to be talking about uh, some of the pain points that we might experience when we put a large language model out. Um, a quick agenda. Um, uh, we're going to do a quick introduction. I'm going to do setup again for people who just joined. And then we'll be talking about some of the large language model pain points. And then we'll um, talk a little bit about how Langkit, the open source project that I shared in the chat, can help solve these. And then we'll uh, mostly be going through a hands-on example where you can take a notebook, run it, and uh, do all this live, and then hopefully take what you learned and put it in a project um, outside of this workshop. Um, so just, again, we'll be doing a little bit of slides just to kind of set up the scene and get everyone on the same page, and then we'll be doing hands-on part. Um, a quick introduction about myself. My name is Sage Elliott. I'm a machine learning and MLOps evangelist at YLabs. Uh, we create awesome tools around AI and ML observability. Um, again, we're going to see some of those today uh, with LangKit, which is our um, uh, language toolkit to extract metrics from really any language models, but obviously a lot of people are using it in large language model applications right now. And uh, for over the past decade, I've worked as software engineer or hardware engineer or doing a lot of stuff with uh, computer vision um, around in Seattle, Washington and in Melbourne, Florida. So like someone in the chat earlier was saying they're from St. Petersburg, so you weren't too far away from me. And um, in general, I love making things with technologies. Uh, so I always have, you know, a lot of uh, hobby projects going on. And if you want to stay connected, uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, search for Sage Elliott, or I'll share the link in the chat right now. And quickly uh, about you. So I saw more people join. Uh, I al already appreciate the people talking in the chat. That is awesome. Um, if you just join, say hello in the chat. 
uh, at the bare minimum, maybe put where you're watching from. That's always fun and interesting to see where people are watching from. And if you don't mind sharing, uh, what are you building with large language models? Or if you have an interesting idea, maybe you haven't actually started building it yet, uh, put it in the chat as well. That's always really fun to see. And uh, I also want to ask, what types of models would you like to see in another workshop or um, a, a, an example? And so if you do have a type of model that you're using, like Falcon or Bloom or any of those, um, I'd love to hear about it in the chat as well. And the next workshop, I could take that data. So if you're like, ah, I really want to see it with uh, um, you know, Llama 2 or something like that, we'll see if that can run on uh, some, some resources. Um, share it in the chat. And again, the link is in the description, but I'll share um, the link to the Slack channel, which I recommend joining, so you can ask questions uh, after the workshop there. I won't be checking that during the workshop, so if you do have any questions during this, uh, put them in the YouTube chat or the, the LinkedIn chat. Several people said hello. You should also say where you're watching from or what you're building with large language, language models. Um, and then in Slack, um, there's that introduction channel, so say hello in there as well, and I'll say hello later. Um, all right, so setup again for anyone who just came in. Um, really, the only setup that can take a couple minutes, hopefully just a minute or so, is uh, creating the free account where we're going to send profiles uh, of our data, uh, some metrics around our, lang our large language model so we can observe them over time, um, is uh, the, the YLabs account, so that could just take a minute to set up. You just put in your email, verify it, and you should be good to go. There's no card or anything required. And then also, again, if you want to check out Langkit, the, the open source project we'll mainly be using today, um, you can go check out the GitHub. Again, we always appreciate a star. And then I'll share this again before we actually go through the coding, but this is going to be the Colab notebook that we're going to run through. So if you are adventurous and familiar, you know you could already start poking around in that Colab notebook. Um, all right, so what is ML monitoring and AI observability? So you might have heard about this or seen some of this in some other um, context. So, you know, around in tabular data or uh, uh, computer vision, um, and maybe you're starting to look at language me metrics now. Um, often there's things that can go wrong with model inputs and outputs and model performance overall. So model inputs, it's common to monitor for data drift. So is the data that's going into your model changing over time? Is the quality changing over time? Is it degrading? And then same with your model output. So is your model continuing to put out the outputs that you want? Um, and a lot of times this can be measuring like a, a tabular a numerical value. So if you're you know doing the iris data set and all your uh, uh, um, pedal widths are between one and two um, centimeters long, and then all of a sudden you have one that's three, you know that that doesn't look like the data that the model was trained on. Um, so you'd probably either want to see if there is a data quality issue, or maybe flowers started growing longer, and then you want to retrain your model. Um, to account for that. Um, and then you also have things like model and performance uh, uh, metrics that you've probably seen before, like accuracy and recall, bias and fairness, explainability, and then you want those to kind of interact with your uh, business KPI as well. We have a saying as uh, bad data happens to good models. So has anyone experienced any sort of model drift before or data drift, even outside of a large language model, just on tabular data or some other type of data? Someone said they're from Italy, and they're using Falcon. Awesome. Thank you for providing um, some insight into the models that you're using as well. And yeah, I want to do a workshop and some examples using Falcon. I'm also excited that Llama 2 is out now uh, since yesterday. So probably going to do some stuff around that. All right. So um, how does ML monitoring kind of fit in with large language models? Because they're a little bit different. Um, and, and people, like you might not even have access to the full model if you're using something like GPT. Um, so you're likely familiar with LMs at this point. Uh, probably most people here have, have used ChatGPT. Um, a lot of people building stuff, myself included, have probably used Hugging Face. And then uh, this is the Dolly logo from uh, Databricks. Uh, they recently acquired M Mosaic, and so I'm guessing they're going to be uh, using more Mosaic models. So I might need to replace this logo later. <laughs> and then uh, Bing as well. So you've probably um, been using these or seen them in applications for you know chatbots, um, agents, summarization. Someone even worked, or someone even said in the chat that they're working on summarization. And then obviously Q and A applications. Um, so, so what are some common pain points with LLMs? And again, if you've experienced any of these, especially if you're building models or anything like that, like some people are saying in the chat, I would love to hear 
if you've experienced kind of some of these pain points, because we probably all have in, in some way or another. Um, you might experience hallucinations where, you know, you have irrelevant or inaccurate responses. Um, sometimes they're, they're risk prone depending on your application, but, you know, you might ask your large language model question and it just makes stuff up <laughs> and uh, it sounds good sometimes, but it's not accurate. Um, the um, prompt engineering, so usually, right, if you're building an application, maybe it's even around just ChatGPT, their API, uh, but you build a system prompt around it where, you know, you're you're telling it what it is and how to answer questions. And those typically, uh, when you have these in production, you're probably changing them over time. That's kind of like you're fine tuning a lot of the time. And uh, when you make changes to it, how do you measure if, um, you know, that change was good or bad? Um, it could be hard to track those changes over time. So like, yeah, I could do a prompt engineering change. Then all of a sudden my responses from my large language model, uh, let's say the sentiment gets really negative or something like that, uh, where it used to be positive. And if I'm not tracking certain metrics that, that I decide are important for my large language model, um, it can be hard to tell what's going on there. Um, yeah, so it's often, at least for my, when I've talked to people, and obviously I know this is pretty new field, so people are still figuring it out. Um, it's the main driver of your LM behavior in a lot of applications. Like I was saying, like you take a GPT model, you give this prompt, and that's what's going to give it kind of the behavior that you want. And when I've talked to people, a lot of times it's uh, unmonitored, or they go in and you know poke around at it once in a while. Um, so I'd love to hear your experience. Like, have you um, probably been experimenting with prompt engineering? And if so, how do you kind of measure the changes, especially if it is a model in production? Like, how are you? tracking over time that that change to that prompt was actually good or not. And then you have output uh, validation. You know, this can kind of go with uh, hallucinations as well, where uh, your, your response is, um, you know, maybe not giving the appropriate um, topics. Uh, for example, if you asked a financial chatbot around dating advice, maybe it shouldn't uh, give any advice back and say, hey, you know, as a large language, as a financial large language model, I'm not suited to give you advice there. Um, so we made Linkit. Um, again, I shared the link to the open source project. Totally recommend checking it out. Obviously, that's what we're going to be diving in a little bit more uh, here today. So hopefully this will be a good introduction to it. Um, it allows you to set up guardrails. So again, we'll be looking at how we can use it to extract these uh, uh, language metri metrics from our prompts and responses. And then you can do things like, you know, measure for prompt jailbreaks where people are, you know, trying to get your model to do something that it shouldn't be doing. Um, so it's not giving you metal medical advice. You can also measure for like pattern matching, you know, is there a credit card number or phone number when it shouldn't be in there? Um, same on responses. And then uh, evaluation, you can compare those user prompts, your, you know, how your uh, model changed in any of these metrics. Um, when you change the prompt, you can also compare models. So you might have multiple prompts or models going at the same time, seeing which one's giving the best responses, um, and then either choosing the best response or using this as like a shadow deployment method where you might want to uh, change your prompt, see how it performs over time, and then maybe deploy that one out. So it's actually interacting with customers. Um, and then also we'll look at like observability, you know, sentiment over time, are these things changing? And then you can go back and look at your prompts and responses and kind of see what happened there. So um, just here's like kind of a little graphic um, showing kind of what's happening. So you get your prompt, you're measuring things like yeah, sentiment score, toxicity, et cetera, all these different metrics. And we'll, we'll go into the metrics in a little bit. We'll see which ones are out of the box um, in, in Linkit. And you can also add your own. And then you can also measure these things on responses. So you're measuring um, different metrics that you choose are important around your prompts, the user prompts, um, and your uh, responses. Um, and it's easy to use. This picture actually shows using our LangChain integration, which I'll link to later as well. So we have an official LangChain integration. If you're using LangChain, it's only just a few lines of code to get it working in there, which is really cool. Um, and it's just a few extra lines of code if you uh, uh, without our official integration. And so today we're actually going to be using this with a hugging face model. Uh, but it also shows you how to use it with really any large language model today. And then we could kind of measure these um, uh, metrics over time. So in this case, this is um, like a prompt sentiment. And you can see that, you know, we detect on this day, I think it looks like the sentiment uh, went up in this case. So maybe something got more positive. Maybe we'd want to see, oh, this is a good thing, actually. Maybe we changed our um, prompt and uh, it made people happier, which is great in that case. 
So just a high level architecture diagram of like what this might look like. Again, you have your prompts coming in, you have your large language model, and then you have your responses. And we're going to be using Langkit to collect these uh, 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 telemetry uh, around the prompts and responses. And then with that, we can do things like measure quality, sentiment, uh, security, like if you know there's any PI in there, et cetera. And again, Linkit is open source. So if you want to make contributions, you can. Um, you can see everything that's going on in there. We have integrations and it's also extendable. So um, you can add your own metrics, uh, et cetera. Uh, it, so we have a whole bunch of pre-built metrics out of the box, but you can add other ones in that might be important for your use case. And it's uh, uh, natively integrated into the Ylabs ecosystem. So again, we have an observability uh, store or, that we'll be looking at today. And again, it kind of looks like this. You have your uh, model infrastructure, your ML infrastructure, you're collecting privacy preserving uh, data statistics. So if you're not familiar with our other open source library, Ylogs, um, how it works is we collect kind of uh, aggregated statistics around your data, but not we don't actually use your raw data. So you can think of this like the mean, um, the, the max, the min of your tabular data, for instance. And then using just that kind of fingerprint of your data, we're able to detect things like data drift. So it's really cool for applications where you don't want to send your raw data outside of your environment, like healthcare or uh, financial data. It's also really lightweight profiles. And again, we'll be seeing this with large language model uh, metrics uh, today. And then with that, you can create things like reports and dashboards. You can set up alerts and notifications. And you can also trigger a uh, workflow. So one workflow I always like to talk about is um, you know, when you're deploying an ML uh, um, system, typically you know, a good question is, when do you retrain it? Or in this case, with large language models, maybe it's when do you change your prompt? Um, because maybe you're not retraining a whole large language model in this case, if you're using something like GPT-4. Um, but how do you kind of make that model better? And uh, the question is when, you know, or the answer is when it kind of stops performing as well, or you think you can increase performance. So with monitoring, you can see like if data drifted, um, you could trigger an automated workflow to have someone annotate that data, give you the ground truth, and then you could actually um, compare accuracy or whatever score you want on a, a retrained model with that new data and then put that new model in production and, and hopefully improve your uh, user experience with a more accurate model. All right, so that is enough slides. Let's go ahead and get on to what I think is the more fun part, the hands-on portion. So I'm going to copy these links in chat. Again, if you're um, on YouTube, they are also in the description. So just look down there and put them in chat. I got to paste them also in the LinkedIn chat as well. And also, if you're um, scared of code, which hopefully no one is here, and even if you've never done a lot of programming, don't worry, you can take this CodeLab notebook and I'll walk you through what's happening. And um, you can actually run all the code even if you don't have a lot of experience programming. So don't be too scared of it. But there is a demo org for the YLabs observability um, product. So if you don't want to run all this code, um, and put your own data in, which I think is more fun, um, you can check out the demo org as well, which I just put the link in the chat. And again, I'll put these in LinkedIn chat. And I'll give everyone a minute to go ahead and sign up for the account if you haven't already. Uh, we'll need it a little bit down in the notebook. Also, if somebody in the chat can let me know that the notebook, like they were able to open it, um, usually it's fine, but occasionally something happens and the sharing setting gets weird or something like that. So if someone can open up that notebook link, let me know that it worked, that would be great. And there's a couple messages I'm gonna catch up on in chat as well, while people are signing up for that free account or opening the notebook. So you should get a notebook, it should look something like this. And once you're here, I recommend creating your own copy of it where you'll be able to edit all the code, all the text. Um, so if you want, you can take notes or just edit the code as you go, play around, see what happens, which I always uh, recommend. Save a copy and drive. So once you get this, you should go to file, save a copy and drive. And then if somebody in the chat wants to let me know that the access is okay, maybe that they could save their own copy, that would be great. And someone said, someone said uh, notebook access is okay. Awesome, thank you for letting me know. Someone said hello from Nigeria. Awesome, welcome. What time is it in Nigeria? I, I don't remember time zones, so <laughs> I always like to ask people. Someone said they've started recording the changes in the doc. 
along with the reasons why they made the changes. So that's probably in reference to when I was talking about prompt engineering and adjusting your prompts. Yeah, so what I've seen is like people, hopefully people record it just like you were saying, at least in a doc. Um, and then I don't know right now, you said you like you you put in a doc and then you mod um, write why you made the change. And then I guess you probably look at how people are experienced the large language model or or the responses in some way, even if that's just you spot checking it and then seeing if that was a right change for it. Someone said they're still figuring out why to track and that's why they're here. Awesome. Yeah, hopefully this will be interesting uh, for you. Someone talked about it'll be interesting to see similar AutoML capabilities. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like people were able to open the notebook. Um, again, I'll just give everyone a minute. Um, go ahead and hit save a copy and drive. I'm going to do that myself. Someone said, Linkit can also integrate and be used in various cloud provider solutions like Azure or OpenAI. Yeah. So. Um, I actually have another example. If you go to the Linkit repo and go to examples, there is a um, an example with Langchain and OpenAI. Uh, but yeah, as long as um, you can install a Python package in your environment, you, you can use um, Linkit and Ylogs basically, basically in any environment. Um, even I haven't tried Linkit in it yet, but it should work. Uh, but I've even used Ylogs on like a Raspberry Pi, which is pretty cool if you want to do some sort of uh, lightweight monitoring on like an edge device, um, you can do that as well. So said, oh, this is response about the prompt engineering monitoring. They have a lot of non-engineers writing prompts. So recording the changes and the reasons hopefully leads to more learning across the board. Yeah, really interesting. And, and again, like this is a new space for everyone. So it, it's fun seeing how everyone's kind of tackling these challenges right now. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So hopefully everyone can see my collab notebook. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get a start on this Colab notebook. Again, um, hopefully you sign up for the YLabs account as well. So you should have something that looks like this when you go to the homepage. We won't do anything here quite yet. We'll come back to this in a second. So I'm going to go to my copy of the notebook. Um, this links, again, to some other uh, documentation about metrics, in, uh, about Linkit um, in here. So if you want to read more about these, definitely recommend it. Um, and we'll just kind of run code and kind of look at these as we go in this case. So um, we're going to show how to uh, generate some out-of-the-box metrics for hugging face models in this case. But really, what we're going to cover today, like we'll be using hugging face, but you'll see how to use this for any large language model that you're using. You really, you just need to extract uh, prompts and responses in like a dictionary format, and then you can log them with Linkit. So we'll be using hugging face today. That's probably what a lot of people are using. Uh, but just want to note that no matter what you're using, you should uh, um, be able to do uh, use it. Um, and today, we're going to be using a GPT-2 model. So uh, we'll see why the craze uh, didn't really happen until GPT 3.5, because the, the responses gener uh, GPT 2 generates is not super amazing. The reason why we're using it today instead of a better model is just because it's really lightweight um, and it's easy to run without a GPU. So you can um, set up some G GPU time in here with uh, Google Colab, but uh, we're just going to stick with this so it's easy to run for anyone. Um, and then, um, yeah, this is Google Colab if you've never used it before. Um, it's essentially Google's way of hosting a Jupyter Notebook, so you can write code and documentation kind of all in one place here. And let's go ahead and run our first code cell. So you can run code cells by hitting this play button, or when it's highlighted like this, you can hit shift enter. Um, the first code cell you run, you, it'll take a few seconds. It's actually spinning up or initializing a whole little Ubuntu instance for us to run in. So now we have this Ubuntu instance, we can actually pip install uh, Python packages in here as well. and. Google Colab comes pre-installed with a whole bunch of standard machine learning libraries already in here. So even if you're using something like scikit-learn, you don't have to pip install it. But uh, we're going to pip install transformers from Hugging Face today and link it. So go ahead and run this cell. And this will just take um, a few seconds to run as well as they get installed into our environment. Yeah, I, I, I might have said most people, and, and uh, that's just from talking with, with my friends. Someone asked about, uh, curious why most people are using hugging face models, what kind of use cases. I guess uh, with 
some of my group of people that I talk about it with are uh, using them in specific use cases like healthcare and fine tuning them on data. Um, so they're using often like a hugging face model that they can fine tune. But that's a good point. I uh, actually most people now technically could be using GPT open AI models because it's so easy to use their API. So I might have misspoke there on uh, saying most people. Um, someone asked again about the cloud thing, and maybe I'll follow up with you with you on this. Um, if if you want to talk a little bit more about, well, hopefully also this will answer your question, kind of what's collected in here um, on data wise. But yeah, basically with Y logs or Linkit, uh, no raw data is leaving your cloud environment um, unless you uh, make a metric about it and, and pass it out. But by default, we'll see. We just kind of have these aggregate statistics about our, our data. But yeah, um, if you want to sync up more about it, I'd love to answer more questions about like if you have a specific use case, um, ping me in Slack or on uh, LinkedIn, and I can follow up about it. All right, so now that these are installed, let's do a quick look at Linkit metrics, um, and then we'll dive into uh, doing this with a hugging face model. So first, we're going to go ahead and import Linkit. Or, or from Linkit, we're going to import LLM metrics. Um, the first time we initialize these metrics, it can take a few seconds because it uh, downloads some models in, in uh, behind the scenes here that it uses to create these metrics. So you could think of this as like an LTK model for sentiment, et cetera, um, around these metrics that we're going to collect. And again, we'll look at what these metrics look like. Um, in a second. And we're also using this um, session type Ylabs Anonymous. So this is going to make it really easy for us to um, kind of gather some metrics here and then visualize them in Ylabs. Uh, but then we'll also see how we can access them just in a pandas data frame in our, in our environment right afterwards. Uh, but you don't have to do this um, uh, anonymous session if you're kind of already set up with a Ylabs account. And we'll see this in action a little bit further down in the notebook. So go ahead and run this code cell. Um, we're loading in some example chats. I believe these are actually from a hugging face uh, data set. And then we're just going to log like the 51st chats and extract some metrics out of them uh, with this y.log method. So we're saying y.log. We're extracting chats. And we'll see what this format looks like a little bit later. But this is really just in a dictionary format where we have prompt, text of that prompt, and then response. Uh, those are both the keys, the prompts, and the response, and then the text of those uh, prompts and responses. And now we get this little link generated down here. Now again, we'll explore this uh, further down in the notebook with uh, looking at it in a pandas data frame, and then also setting it up so you can actually write over time um, for monitoring with Ylabs. But go ahead and click this link. This is going to give us a little preview of some of the out of the box uh, metrics that are collected with Linkit. So you can scroll down um, and see kind of all these metrics here. You can see like aggregate reading level. Uh, readability index, uh, character count, etc. And um, what you can do is click on just somewhere in here on this box, and it'll come up with histogram data here as well as box plots. So you can see um, one thing I like to look at, I think it makes a lot of sense for people, is uh, sentiment. And we'll be looking at this later as well. But so there's going to be a uh, NLP, uh, or sorry, NLTK sentiment score here, where it's going to go from, in this case, uh, these are all um, not too negative, I guess, most of them, right? Like, it, majority of them skew positive in this case, or, or around zero, neutral. Uh, but these are uh, um, all these kind of out-of-the-box metrics that are collected with uh, uh, Linkit, and then you can customize these. So if you want to add more, you can. Um, you can add custom metrics, and then... Um, you can also like do a lighter weight metric if you don't want all of these things. But these are things like sentiment, um, readability, toxicity, uh, things that we think are important probably for most larger language models out of the box. And then if you go to the next page, where I just clicked down here to navigate to the next page, we have one response relevance to prompt as well. So you can um, measure things like, you know, did the response from my model make sense? Probably was it relevant to the prompt coming in? If it really wasn't, then maybe something that is up with your um, your system prompt, and you might want to change that. So just a quick look at um, some of the metrics. We're going to dive way deeper into these. We just kind of want to show right out of the box. You can collect all these things like prompt and response, uh, sentiment, toxicity, 
um, response, relevance, etc. And I encourage you to play around in more of these. And then also in the link kit uh, GitHub, you can read more about all these metrics as well. So I'm going to go back to the notebook. And uh, let's scroll down a little bit more. Someone said they don't see the same YLab screen. Do you see YLabs at all? Um, so you should get this link um, generated down here. And then you should be able to click on it. And it should open up this kind of anonymous session here where, where you're not logged in. So if you did go to the other one where you're creating an account, um, it won't show up there yet because we haven't set up our API key. Um, but if you just go ahead and run this code cell, this link should be generated down here. And this is just kind of a session um, where you can go claim it with your account later. Uh, but it's a quick way of visualizing the data in this kind of histogram format. So a cool way of just like very quickly um, spot checking your data. Oh, and of course, I missed out on a really great feature is we have these uh, auto-generated insights as well. So these are things like the, the pattern matching, like I talked about, um, you might find out that your I did this actually <laughs> this is a, a real use case I had where using my LM, I found out it was generating a phone number, like I said, and I didn't give it a phone number to use. So it actually just was generating a fake phone number um, to users, which is <laughs> which was really funny. Um, I didn't think GPT would like do that out of the box. And it's clearly like a fake one, like it says like 1-800-7892 or whatever. Um, but here we can see like patterns, jailbreak, uh, negative sentiment, uh, all these things are kind of auto detected in these uh, different columns. And again, we'll uh, be looking at uh, more data and passing it in here as well. But yeah, this is a really cool way of quickly getting insights um, on on your model, both on prompts and responses. So you'll notice too, like it's prompt dot whatever and response dot whatever, and all those um, show up. Oh, one other thing is, um, so someone said it wasn't showing up. It should auto be selected if you just have one profile. Uh, but for some reason, if it wasn't, you can hit this little drop down. And um, also one other thing is if you click the link super fast, maybe the profile wasn't uploaded quite yet. And you could hit refresh and hopefully they're there. For the person who said they didn't see the same screen, uh, let me know if that worked. Someone said, uh, how is relevance to the prompt calculated? Um, I think we have a model um, doing that behind the scenes. Again, you can look in the open source. And I'd have to um, brush up with my the engineer who made it to probably give you the details that you'd want. But it is in the, the open source um, GitHub repo if you want to check it out. And again, I can also follow up with you or have our data scientists follow up with you. All right, so going back in my notebook, I'm going to keep going here. Um, let's go ahead from transformers. We're going to import the GP2 uh, model and the tokenizer for it. So this can take a few seconds to run. And then just noting, so um, down here, this is, a, is an example of using this with like a different model. Um, again, we're using GPT-2 because it's lightweight and kind of easy to run for this like fun example to go through. Uh, but here, you could actually already, if you downloaded Llama 2 yesterday, um, you could use, use Llama 2 here today. And then we're going to create a um, GPT model function. Again, this is a super simple function. You might want to add um, some parameters up here instead of just having them baked in here. But all we're doing is <clears throat> setting the tokenizer for our GPT-2 model. We're going to get the generated output. So it's going to give us 100 characters. Its temperature is 0 0.8. So it's going to be a little creative probably today. And it's GPT-2, so it's always pretty creative, I think. <laughs> and then we're going to get a response back. And then, so um, no matter what type of large language model you're using, whether it's hugging face or not, this is what I was talking about. Really, as long as you get the prompts and responses in this format, you can use Lankit and YLabs with it. So here we have a prompt and response, which is going to get returned. And this is just a dictionary with the key prompt and the key response, and then the prompt text and the response text. So let's go ahead and run this. And then we'll see an example of it. Um, here's just GPT-2. We're passing in, tell me a story um, about a cute dog. And then it's uh, generating a little response here. Tell me a story about a cute dog. 
do you have a sweet tooth? <laughs> Which I think, again, if we use GPT uh, 3.5 or uh, 4, it'd probably give us a much better response in this. So it's actually kind of fun to look at GPT 2 in this case, too, and, and see you've probably used 3.5 or 4, um, seeing how much it's improved and why, why people are so excited from 3.5. All right, so let's create and inspect some lang language metrics um, from our model now. So this is kind of similar to like we did up above, except for uh, we're not going to be using the YLabs Anonymous session here. We're just going to use this y.log method. So I'm also setting this um, max column to none in, in pandas because it's going to be a large data frame that we can look at and see how all those metrics are captured. And then we're going to call profile. So we're going to use y.log. So again, uh, ylogs is the tool where you can create these statistical profiles of your data. And in this case, we're using on language metrics and we're passing in that schema that we made here, which we pull in all those um, language metrics from Linkit. And then um, if we look at it in a data frame, we can call profile view, then we can uh, change that view to data frame. Uh, here, we just passed in one prompt right now so this might not be super interesting but if you scroll through here you can see that for all those metrics that we had in ylabs like we saw in that anonymous session uh, we have all these um, columns in our data frame as well as like type string etc uh, but here let's just look at aggregate reading level for example uh, we have the cardinality of it we have the count and then we have the distribution so like what was the max the mean the minimum on this specific um, a metric and then you'll see these distribution metrics for all these different ones and with with that we can use um, y labs or you could build your own tool uh, use it in your local environment to kind of capture or use any of this data to see if there's drift or add any uh, guardrails to to your model so again let's see a little bit more interesting in an example i'll just run this code this is going to pass in three prompts now and this will make our uh, profiles look a little bit more interesting probably so i'm just saying what is ai Tell me a joke, uh, who won the World Series in 2021. And then we're uh, just enumerating over those prompts in that list, doing exactly like we did before. We're, we're uh, running that GPT model. And by the way, uh, because we're just on a CPU here, it can take um, you know several seconds or, or a little bit more than several, like 10 seconds or something per prompt. Um, but that's why it's taking a while. It's actually just the uh, GPT model running on a CPU. Um, the logging is actually incredibly fast here. And then we're just saying if it's the first prompt in there, we're initializing the ylog schema. And then after that, we're going to call this profile.track. So we created our first profile, and then we're able to um, add other uh, profiles to it, basically. So now, if we look at um, here uh, our profile now, we can see that there's a cardinality of three. So we have those three different uh, prompts that went in there. And then we have all these metrics, again, for um, these three prompts together so we can see you know what was the cardinality what was the um, in this case this is the response relevant uh, relevance to prompt and we have a score here the the max the mean the min etc between all these um uh, uh three prompts and responses and then all of those metrics again and it's hard to scroll through all these in a very large um uh, uh, data frame here, but we saw these all in our YLabs Anonymous session, right, where we have all these um, metrics collected and then our statistics about them. And we'll see very shortly how to use these distribution metrics to create a, um, a, a, a monitor that we can monitor over time. So here we have like the min, the max, et cetera, logged for all these different metrics. And then when something changes, uh, like we set a threshold, um, if it changes beyond a certain threshold, trigger some sort of alert or a workflow, um, let us know what's going on. So this could be really useful, like we were talking about changing your prompt, your system prompts. And if all of a sudden um, sentiment went up or down, et cetera, um, that can be flagged here. So also, um, someone talked about you know monitoring or changing their system prompts. I'd love to, love to know, like, do you have a specific metric that you look for when you change those prompts to see if something went up or down. So we have all these out of the box ones. Um, you can add your own custom metrics as well. 
uh, one thing I like to use sentiment as an example because one I do like to actually measure that, but also I think it just makes a lot of sense for people. It's easy to know like ah oh, something got more negative or something got more positive, but there's all these different metrics that you might be wanting to to uh, monitor over time. So let's look at how we can set this up with those profiles. I'm just mentioning, so you now have these pandas profiles in your environment. Uh, we're going to send those to YLabs where we can set up these um, this kind of dashboard and get these visualizations and set up alerts. But you can also do anything in your local environment uh, with this profile now. And we'll look at that after we do the YLab stuff. We'll actually look at using these uh, values locally in the CoLab notebook to kind of add guardrails to our um, prompt and responses. Um, all right, so just a tiny bit of setup here if you want to follow along with this part, which I totally encourage. Um, hopefully, you already made the YLabs um, account. Um, if not, go ahead and do that. Again, the link is in the description or if you scroll up in the chat uh, above. Uh, create the free account. Again, there's no card or anything required. Just put in your email. I think you have to verify your email, and then you should be good to go. Uh, we want to get three pieces of data from our YLabs account to set a connection to it. So we want to get the org ID, the API key, and the uh, model ID. So once you have a YLabs account, you should have something that looks like this. You probably won't have these projects in here, though. You might have a demo project that comes in by default. Um, so go to your YLabs page. And then what I'm going to do is hit Create Resource. But you can also get to the same page by going to Settings and model and data set management. Um, this will bring you to this page where you can delete models and add new models. So I'm going to go ahead and just create resource here, really easy. I'm actually going to delete an old model, so I'm not over my free limits here. Um, I'll delete this one, and then I'm going to create a new model. You can give it any name you want. I'll just call this uh, LM Workshop. And then uh, resource type, I'm going to hit a uh, large language model here, but we have all these other resources as well. So if you want to use um, this monitoring system for classification models, regression, et cetera, uh, or just your data pipelines, you can do that. And then by default, the batch frequency here is going to be every day. That means we're going to be clumping all those profiles for each day um, and then monitoring for that whole 24 hours to see if something went wrong in that 24 hours. So I'm going to hit Add Model or Data Set. This is going to give me a model ID. You'll want to grab this model ID. It's one of the pieces of data we want to get. Um, in this case, my model ID is model-233, uh, but yours will probably be 0, 1, 2, et cetera, uh, because you probably haven't made hundreds of models in, in uh, YLabs yet. So go back to the notebook, paste this in. Make sure that you don't get any new lines or spaces in that string. We just want this string to be um, exactly like we saw it there, so model dash two, two, three, or two, three, three in my case. And then I'm going to go back to my YLabs um, tab. And then from the same area, you can just go to access tokens. We're going to generate a new API key. Again, I'll call this LLM workshop. And this gives me a token over here. Again, you could call it anything you want. Copy that token. Paste it into your API key placeholder. One more thing, org ID, it's on the same page. Um, it's two places here. You could copy it from here, or you can copy it uh, from here. And wherever you copy it from, make sure, again, you don't get any extra spaces or quotation marks or anything like that, and then paste it into org ID, and then run this code cell. And that set up our connection to our YLabs account. So now we can take all those profiles that we looked at and uh, push them up to monitor them over time. So I'll give everyone a second uh, or a few seconds to do that. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, if you go to the YLabs account, no matter where you are, you should always be able to go to this little hamburger menu, go to settings, go to model and data set management. Um, if you're not over your limit here, you can type in a new model name, and that's where you can create a new model. Get that model ID that gets generated here, put it in that placeholder. And then from this same page, you can always go to access token, you can create a new token here, um, and that's going to be your API key. You can save that somewhere, by the way, because uh, you won't be able to get the whole string again. Or you can just always create a new one here. And then you want to get org ID, which is always going to be right here as well. So those are the three pieces you need to set up your um, connection to YLabs.
And for anyone who just came in, I think I saw some people join. Um, all the links to everything is in the description below. So we started going through that Google Colab notebook. Uh, you can open that up, save a copy in your drive, and start running through it if you want. We're not too far into it, um, and you can still catch up. We're just setting up the YLabs API key and everything. Did uh, anybody get get the API key? So I'll keep going. Um, I guess I'll wait a few more seconds or a minute, um, and then I'll keep going. And if anyone wants me to go through anything again, let me know. Um, also, if you want, you can ask questions in the Slack later as well. So let's go ahead and run the next code cell now. Um, we're importing the YLabs writer. Uh, we're importing the link hit, uh, metrics again, just like we did before, and the Y logs. And then we're initializing our schema. Again, we already initialized it, so we didn't see that whole download of the models behind the scenes because we already did it up above. Uh, but if you did just uh, join and you scrolled all the way down here, you might have seen this kind of download some stuff uh, because it's using some models to extract metrics around our, our large language model. And then here, let's write just a single profile to YLabs first. And then this will get way more interesting below because uh, we're going to write a whole bunch and simulate like our model being in production for seven days. But let's look at a single profile real quick, just to make sure everything's working. So if you ran that code, you're able to get everything connected. Go to your uh, model here. We can see that um, 35 uh, features are in here. Those are the out-of-the-box metrics. Uh, we have one profile right now. That was our single profile that we just wrote. And then we could go to this input tab. And let's go ahead and stick on the sentiment. We can see we have one little dot here. Um, this might not be super interesting to us yet, but I promise it will be more interesting. Here we can see just from that one profile, um, our score on sentiment was uh, 0 0.57. Uh, so I think there's a, a more on the positive side. Um, yeah, because 0 would be neutral. So this is a fairly positive uh, prompt in this case. But let's go back to the notebook. And if you scroll down, we have this prompt list. Let's go ahead and create this list here. And let's import date time. And then what we're going to do is just uh, enumerate through that prompt list. And then basically, we're acting like each of these uh, lists is a day. So we're going to log three prompts and responses for all these uh, uh, seven days. So this is kind of simulating our model being in production for seven days. And in this case, we're only getting three um, prompts or responses, but that's mainly so the it'll run pretty fast for the workshop. Obviously, you'd probably get more than these, hopefully, uh, in a day. But we're, this is going to give us some really useful, interesting metrics to look at. Um, again, this can take a few minutes to run. That's, again, because we're just using the CPU here um, on our uh, GPT-2 model. So if you do have a better system or you want to go and look at uh, adding a GPU runtime, to your collab, uh, you can do that as well. But this is going to take us a few minutes. And we're getting this. Uh, it's actually uploading to YLabs. We're getting this little bug here uh, because we did the in initializing the anonymous session. Uh, this will be fixed soon as well. So ignore that that it's not uploading. Uh, it actually is uploading here. And you won't get this error um, if you just initialize uh, YLogs and YLabs uh, down, like we did down here and it skipped that anonymous session piece like we did at the beginning. And I see that uh, Felipe answered the prompt and, and uh, the prompt response relevance question. Thank you, Felipe. He's our awesome data scientist, by the way. And again, this will just take a few minutes to get everything in here. But if we go back to the YLabs platform, I'll refresh this page. It won't be complete yet. But we'll start seeing that we're getting this kind of data over time. And already, we could see just in these uh, one, two, three, four days, at least three complete days, um, we're getting some statistics around our, um, in this case, the, the prompt sentiment. We can see that this last day, um, let's just look at the median in this case, is 62. The median down on this day is negative 72. That seems pretty negative to me. Um, and then this one is 54. This one's 51. So already, just based on these three uh, days of data, 
do we think something maybe is going on with our model? It's hard to say because we only have three or four days of data. Um, so maybe it's pretty common to have very negative and, and positive. We don't know yet. Let's refresh. I don't think we're quite done writing all the profiles over. Also, this uh, can vary in time depending which um, instance you get. So in CoLab, you get this kind of free cloud instance, but it does change the GPU and CPU you get. So it might take you a little bit longer, or uh, you might be going faster than I am right now. And I think we're almost done here. But again, if I refresh, we'll have a little bit more data in here already. And we can see that, you know, this is a big dip, probably, based on our historical data. Now we have this dashboard to look at. Uh, we have that all the statistics from our profiles. Almost done. But yeah, so if you've uh, set up your YLabs account and you're writing the data right now, just hover over these and kind of uh, you can see that we have all those metrics uh, for our NLTK or for our, uh, prompt sentiment from NLTK. And then we can see, I like to just as eyeballing it, often I look at the median, uh, but you could look at all these other distribution metrics like the max, the min, uh, the percentiles, et cetera. All right, so we are done running. We can refresh, we have all of our data in here now. So all seven days of data, again, eyeballing the medium, uh, at, which is this darker bar, you can even uh, uh, kind of change what's displayed here as well. So if you actually just wanted to look at the median lines, you could do that or look down here that basically gives you the same line. So definitely looking at this data, um, we think something happened this day. And maybe realistically in production, maybe you change your system prompt and all of a sudden, uh, you know, in this case, we're looking at a user prompt, but you can also be looking at the sentiment from your uh, response. And if it dropped like this, you know, chances are either people are asking neg negative questions or uh, you change your system prompt and something happened where now it's uh, um, giving very negative responses. I'll turn these back on. Um, so this is really cool. This gives us a lot of insight how our model is behaving day over day. And you can click around. Again, I'm just using prompt for this one use case here in the workshop, but click around and look at all these other different uh, metrics that you can use. And again, you could also bring your own model or add your own custom metrics here and monitor these over time. So for example, if you do find a really good metric that you love to measure uh, changes in your system prompt, um, you could bring that over here um, or use it in conjunction with these out of the box metrics. So this is really cool as a dashboard, but uh, maybe I don't want to look at it every day. Or if I want to set a bucket where, you know, it's looking at the data every hour, and I don't want to look at it every hour, I only want to know when something really big changes, we can set up a monitor to do that for us. So let's go to this monitor tab. You can either click monitor manager here, or you're going to hit set up monitors. And we see we have some pre built ones for measuring data drift, data quality, etc. You can also hit um, create new custom monitor, and it'll walk you through um, creating a custom one in the UI. You can also um, get really nitty gritty with it and go in JSON and edit these monitors. So you can really make them do anything you want uh, looking at your data that we get in here. But let's go ahead and hit configure on this data drift one. So we're going to be looking when something drastically changed on kind of our, our um, uh, uh, sentiment pattern in this case. So we can see we have um, our input columns is what we're going to be measuring. And then in this case, we're going to be looking at the entire data set, but you can set up segments in Ylogs too. So if you only want to measure uh, data drift on you know very important segments to your data, you can do so. And then you can see um, we're measuring Hellinger distance in this case. I'm going to make this so it's a little less sensitive. I'm going to say, you know, only trigger a change if the drift score is uh, above 90. So that's saying you know if there was a really big change that happened um, on our data that we're monitoring, um, trigger an alert. And then here, we have some options of how we want to choose a baseline. Um, I'm just going to be looking at the past seven days. So it's going to be looking at the past seven days, see if there's some sort of anomaly detected within that kind of time window. Um, but what I also really like to do sometimes is, especially if you have a training data set, which in this case, you know, we don't for a GPT model. Uh, but if you're using like a tabular data set or computer vision, you might have a training data set. You can use that as a reference profile and basically say, you know, uh, measure change between this training profile. Um, you can also use a reference date. So if there was a date of time where you thought the performance of your LM model was really good, you could select that date here. But in this case, we're just going to be looking at a rolling window of over seven days and try to calculate if there's some sort of um, big change happening in that timeline. So go ahead and hit save. 
But before we do that, you can also configure uh, what happens with this alert. So in this case, I'm just going to have it email me, uh, but you can also set up things like a Slack integration or you can set up a pager duty integration like I talked about. So if you actually want to trigger some sort of workflow when Drift is detected, uh, you can do that here. So let's hit save. And successful little saved. You can set up multiple monitors, by the way. You don't just have to have one. Let's go back to our input tab. And let's go look at that sentiment score again. And now um, this is going to automatically trigger every 24 hours, like I mentioned. So it's going to trigger in six hours. Uh, but let's go ahead and hit preview on our monitor. And we can see that uh, based on just looking at the rolling windows of the last seven days, it triggered this day is an anomaly between all these days, just like we clearly saw. Uh, you can see this little purple bar shows up now, which uh, uh, calculates the Hellinger distance. And this would now trigger an alert where we could go, we could go oh, something uh, drastic happened that day. Maybe we changed the system prompt and everything went horrible. Uh, let's roll back and fix it. Or maybe something went really great. And that, that's a good sign for us too. This is performing way better than our other days. We did the right change to our system prompt. So let's go back to the notebook. Um, and we're kind of at the hour. So I know some people are probably going to be dropping off. I'll go through the rest of this pretty fast. Um, but I just want to mention or shout out in the comments, like, does this seem interesting to people? Um, does this seem like a tool that you'd be interested in using for measuring like your large language models, um, how, the, how they're performing, or like if you make prompts, how, how they're changing over time? I think it's really cool. And I've discovered interesting insights from my models using this. Uh, like I had mentioned, the phone number one is just like a, such a funny use case to me, where it, GPT was just generating this phone number, and I wouldn't have known it about it, except for when I went to my profile page here, and I hit the check insights. Um, it said, hey, pattern matching, there's a phone number in here, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. So I was like, oh, wow, that would suck. So maybe someone tried to call it. Um, so in this case, our insight uh, says, oh, there is some really positive sentiment um, on, on response. So let's go back to our notebook, though. And someone said, excellent, this seems interesting. Someone said they would love to know about matching apps and models that can run SQL queries and how you would best track the results. I'd have to sync up, I think, a little bit uh, with you on that question, exactly what you're looking for. Uh, but again, feel free to uh, send me a message in uh, on, on LinkedIn or in the community Slack as well. Um, so we saw on that one day that um, we had really negative uh, um, prompts and if we did go look at the metrics for responses, we'd also see they probably kind of dip down a little bit. And this is just a giant dictionary of all the prompts and responses that we saved in this case. And we could actually go see, um, well, even if we just scrolled up, we could see from our, our prompt list here that, you know, people are saying like this was a, a customer chat bot. Um, so it's a, this, this made me angry. So, you know, people in this case were having a bad day, I guess, with your product, uh, which also is interesting insight, maybe not even to the model performance, but in this case, a different business KPI that you could uh, capture in your large language model. All right, so just running through the rest of the notebook, um, if you want to look at the prompts and responses here, you can. I'll just get rid of it. Uh, let's look real quick at how we can start using some of those metrics collected with Linkit in your local environment, and we can set up things like guardrails, uh, which is where, you know, Maybe you get a really toxic prompt and you don't want to give a response to it, or your response is toxic and you don't want to display that to a user. So again, um, we're going to import uh, Y logs. We're going to make sure we have the link hit toxicity score in there. Uh, we're initializing our L metrics, just like we've seen before. And then, um, let's see. Oh, I think I just ran that twice. I didn't need to run this cell again. I'll delete that later. So now we're going to create a little function here. We're just saying is not toxic. So we're going to pass in a user prompt in this case. We're going to profile our data just like we did before. So we're going to get that essentially that pandas data frame is how I like to always think of it uh, with all those different metrics in here. So we're going to profile the prompt coming in. Um, that's uh, going to use the, the language metrics. And then um, there's a couple different ways that you could do this. And I have a link in here to a blog post around maybe a little bit more of an elegant way to um, um, use validators to set these guardrails. But in this case, what I'm going to be doing is just uh, getting the value 
from our um, data frame, or our profile in this case. And then I'm going to set an if statement, just saying if the toxicity is above 0.5. So in that giant data frame we saw before, I'm just going to go ahead and look at the max value for the toxicity. And if that toxicity max value is above 0.5, I'm just going to say, hey, uh, this is a toxic one. So I'm going to return false to is not toxic. And then I'll return true if it's less than that, um, if it uh, is not toxic. So for example, we can pass in the string. Oops, I didn't run the model or the um, function. So here I'm going to uh, just pass in, do you like fruit? And it says toxic score is 00146. That's not a toxic score at all. Um, now let's <laughs> add in something really toxic. Uh, we just made up a, a stupid little phrase here saying you dumb and smell bad. And the toxicity, toxicity score on that is really high. You know, you're calling someone dumb and they smell bad. Um, and the toxicity here is uh, above 96%. So very toxic. So now we can, now we know how to extract those kind of metrics. Um, we can use that to make decisions about how our model runs. And someone asked, how did you get to the current screen you're showing? Uh, this is the Google Colab notebook. The link is in the description on YouTube, which I think you're watching from. Um, it should be the I don't know, second or third link down. It should say like LLM monitoring. And then I, I'm just scrolled down on here um, towards the end now. So here uh, we can use this in conjunction with our large language model. Uh, I'm just creating a variable here called user prompt. I'm using that do you like fruit one. We know it's very low toxicity. Um, and then I'm saying, um, you know, if the toxicity prompt is uh, true, uh, go ahead and run that prompt to the model. And uh, then we're just going to print out the, the uh, response. Otherwise, if the toxicity is really low or very high, then in this case, we're not actually going to pass the prompt to the model. Um, but realistically, if you're logging things for your large language model, I'm assuming you'd want to take that prompt, uh, get the response, and maybe you'd really just use this as a decision to not um, display the response because you think the response might be bad. So, But you still might want to have the data of how your model would perform. <laughs> Someone said, how did I craft that toxic statement? I uh, played around with some words that weren't too offensive until I got a very toxic score. <laughs> um, but yeah, so hopefully this is an interesting way of seeing how you can use some of these metrics. And again, we, we're just using toxicity here. Uh, you saw there's a whole bunch that you could use. It might depend on what your model is, like how your model's performing or what your application is. So again, like maybe you want to use the pattern matching. And if someone's inputting a phone number, you don't want to have a response back to that, or you don't want to even accept that prompt potentially. Um, and I won't run this code here, but I just want to mention um, you can use something called a rolling logger. This is uh, really nice to use in production where uh, with Ylogs and Ylabs, you can set up intervals. So just like we saw where we wrote those profiles to Ylabs, um, you can keep kind of um, merging the profiles together and then set an interval to write every five minutes, every hour, et cetera. So you're not always uh, pinging back and forth. So this can also be really good like if you don't have... Um, a fast internet connection or something, you only want to write those profiles uh, every hour. Uh, you can use something called a rolling logger. And other than that, I have links to more resources here. So if you want to check out um, an intro to LangKit example, the links are all down here in the notebook that you have. And uh, one thing I'll call it too, because I'm assuming a lot of people ask for it, is we have a, oops, I just copied the text, not the link. Um, we have a cool LangChain integration. It makes it really easy to use with LangChain. So if you're using LangChain, it's really just like a few lines of code, which is really awesome. Um, and then again, if you want to check out the GitHub with all the other um, information about LangKit, um, do so there. And then other than that, I recommend also joining the Slack channel, which I didn't put the link down there, and ask any questions that either I wasn't able to get to or that you have later on. Um, that was just the collab link again. I'm doing awful at copying stuff today, I guess. Copy link. Oh, or is that just the redirect link for from collab? I don't know if that link will work. I'll get the link from the slides.
yeah. Um, all right. There's the the joining Slack link, which I recommend joining. If you have any questions later, um, ask them there. Um, I'm not sure if I saw your other question. Someone said they were looking elsewhere, but is it getting those metrics live in the course of a request? Um, I'm not sure which metrics you're talking about. If that was on the toxicity score, it gets that when we create the profile of the prompt. So when we pass in, um, do you like fruit, et cetera, there's the function or model behind the scenes that will calculate the toxicity of that text and and you could profile um, multiple prompts and look at the toxicity like we we did before where we profiled uh, three prompts near the top or we passed in several prompts to Y labs uh, you could look at the toxicity score between multiple profiles it doesn't have to be on every single prompt but you could uh, probably like if you want to use guardrails like this on a prompt going in and a response coming out um, you could just profile this and then um, and again, the profiling is pretty quick. The, in this case, the GP2 two takes a second to run in the CPU, uh, but it calculates that score, um, and then you can do something with that score. I'm not sure if that was the profile or the metric you were talking about. Uh, but we're over our hour, um, so I'm going to have to stop the stream soon because I have some other stuff to do as well. I'm sure other people do. Uh, but hopefully you found this interesting um, and it gave you something to think about how to monitor your large language model applications um, in production or even you know even maybe you're not out out in production giving it to users yet but how to measure things like changing your system prompts over time and how to improve your model um, experience for people and again yeah if you found it interesting or insightful uh, feel free to let me know in the chat or let me know in Slack later if you have any questions. Uh, if you're building something with large language models or just anything in uh, machine learning and you have questions around AI or machine learning observability and ML monitoring, feel free to reach out to me um, in all the places that I've linked to before. And yeah, hopefully this is fun and interesting for, for some of you. It sounded like it was pretty cool or, or people thought it was cool. I thought it was cool, obviously. So I said, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. And again, stay connected in those places. Feel free to ask me questions later. I think I will wrap up the stream now. And hopefully I'll talk to some of you all later. Also, feel free to let me know what other types of examples you'd like to see. If you want to see a workshop on a specific model, let me know as well. Um, so if you're working, someone mentioned Falcon earlier. Um, I'll probably do some sort of example specific around a Falcon model. Uh, but also, if you have any other ones, let me know in uh, on uh, Slack or LinkedIn. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. And again, like I said, hopefully I'll talk to some of you all later.